Um, I have to say, I was sharing with Mark um, a couple of weeks ago, we were discussing business strategy. And I said to him, whenever I feel overwhelmed by business or scared or you know, challenged in any way, that drives me to my knees. Uh, and I shared with him what I call the exchanges I experience when I spend time in God's presence. Well, that was two weeks ago, and Mark just looked at me and go, that needs to be a preach. So be careful what you share with your pastor. <laughs> Actually, no, his job is to push us outside of our comfort zone and get us to grow, so here we are. Uh, seriously, it really is my joy to be a part of this presence and power series. And as Mark said, well, Mark kicked us off with a series with a powerful message of who we are in Christ from Ephesians 1, the position that we have seated in heavenly places, the, the, the dynamis power that lives in each of us, and the authority that we have in Jesus's name when we're in relationship with him. Fred helped us understand that we malfunction when we're not in fellowship with God. Sally challenged us to become a prophetic people who watch what the Father is doing and then speak life into and bring heaven closer to situations around us. And then last week we had Chris remind us of the power of our testimony. So today it's, it's going to be a combination of my testimony and going deeper in the presence and power of God through spending time with him. We're going to be looking at three transforming exchanges that happen when we spend time in the presence of God. Um, I, th there's a visual that keeps coming to me as we do this presence and power series that I want to share, and it's, it's moving us, I think, from this mindset of church as a filling up station where we come in here running on empty, looking to be fueled up for the rest of the week, and changing that mindset to having our own charging stations at home where we get charged up through our daily experiences with God and come together fully filled up, ready to worship, ready to impact lives, empowered by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in the nation. So that's what I want us to look at. Let's, let's just pray that. Lord, would you just be present and speak the words that you want spoken this morning through me. Let it be all about you, Lord, not about me. Open our hearts to hear your word in a new way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, before I get into the exchanges, I'll share a little bit of my story so that you understand the context of my faith journey. Um, let me just point out, I like to say I'm not an authority on theology, I'm not an authority on life, but I am an authority on my life. And I, <laughs> and I know the, the transforming experiences that I have, and my prayer is that as I share them and ground them in the Word, it will encourage you and me to go even, even deeper. Apologies to the Business Connect group who will have to endure hearing my story again but no apologies for hearing the exchanges again. Just that comes with a prayer that it will go even deeper this time. So <clears throat> I was born in the UK, uh, but I grew up in Jamaica when my parents left when I was three. And my parents were God-fearing. They taught us to pray from an early age. And at the age of 11, I gave my heart to the Lord. I answered an altar call. There were no flashing lights and angels, but I just noticed that I started having more of a desire to really know God. I, I consider myself, I like to say, a multilingual in church traditions because I was christened uh, Catholic, did Holy Communion Catholic, confirmed Methodist, in my university years was evangelical, uh, spent 20 years Pentecostal, and in the last decade, here I am at Verso Vineyard. So I can do, uh, I can genuflect, I can do smells and bells, I can do happy clappy, I can do everything in between. So wherever you are, feel comfortable, I speak your language. Um, <clears throat> life as a young Christian, teenager, all the way into my 20s was very straightforward. And it felt like everything that I prayed, God said yes. 
including getting um, the Once in a Lifetime Road Scholarship to come back to the, to the UK, study at Oxford, and meet my husband, John. The, the, the line we like to use is, I came to get my masters, and I got my mister as well. <laughs> so we both finished studies. We uh, went into professional careers in the city. We had an amazing opportunity to live and work in Japan uh, for a year. And we lived in this beautiful high rise on the 22nd floor. And I remember standing in the panoramic window in the living room, and I said, God, I thank you for my life. And I promised that if anything were to change, I would still worship. And I really meant it, but I didn't want God to test me on it. <laughs> and that was the beginning of real faith going deep. There were three really defining moments in my life, uh, faith at, at that time. The, the first was John and I decided to start a business together famous line is, how hard can it be? But we weren't skilled to deal with the very different work styles and approaches that we have. And in three months, the wheels came off and it literally almost broke us. And it was a very frightening time because at this point, our income, our marriage, our business, everything was on the line. Little did we know that that would become the birthing place of God's purpose for us in the work we've been doing in relationship education for the last 30 years. That was the first one. The second one was the pain of struggling year after year to have children. We were the first of five siblings on either side to get married, and every year, another sibling would announce a new grandchild when every month was a tearful disappointment for us, and that went on for years. And then the third challenge was with my dad's illness. Now, the Bible says your faith will be tested by fire. The fire was about to get seriously hot. So as the year ticked over from 1999 to 2000, my dad's life was hanging in the balance, battling with cancer. And I said, okay, God, you've not been in a hurry to answer this prayer for children. By then, it was probably five years of praying. So I will exchange that prayer if you will just heal my dad. I prayed, I fasted, people prayed, fasted. I did everything I knew to do from the Christian world. And on January 12, 2000, my dad died. And that rocked my faith. There I was with no children and no dad. And I remember sitting in a church service, because that was my habit, and there was a woman singing, I love the way you father me. And I was angry with God and angry with the world, and I sat there and I said, God, I do not like the way you father me, because if you were my dad, you would have done something, you would have turned up. And it was very hard. And I kept turning up to quiet time. I didn't know what to pray, but that was my habit. So I would turn up and I would sit there. And I tell you, I now know that the Holy Spirit is real. Because when I had nothing left to give, nothing left to pray, nothing, less that, nothing else that I could do, to lift myself from that very dark place, the Holy Spirit was still faithful and working on the inside. Transformation happens when we spend time with him. One of the things that I really missed was that deep belly laugh. You know, when you just laugh with abandon, I'm from the Caribbean and, that, and Africans will know, you know, we do that really well. You just totally unsuppressed. I miss that. I didn't have that deep joy anymore. But slowly, as I turned up, that joy started to bubble to the surface again. And I remember one day, again in quiet time, I said, you know what, God? You win. I surrender. You are God, and I am not. 
So with children or no children, whatever it is, I am yours. Where else am I going to go? And that became the kind of theme of my life. There is a, there is a, a, a line that um, this guy, Howard Thomas, uh, Thompson something, not somebody I'm quoting and I'm not putting up the slide because I don't know how kosher it is to be honest. <laughs> But anyway, I'll tell you what it says that means something to me. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. And that, for me, is what I want in my Christian walk, totally spent doing everything God meant for me to do, enjoying this amazing adventure of life with God. Um, the, the story of the miracle of our two children will have to be for another time, but suffice it to say, seven years of tears, two failed IVFs, major surgery, and doctors literally giving up on us, saying there's nothing else they can do. And then God said yes, twice. First with Liana, her name means God has heard. And then with Isaac, who you saw playing keyboards, his name means laughter. That's God. And so that brings me neatly to the three transforming ex exchanges that renew our mind, change our approach to life, change our thinking as we spend time with God. And the first is exchanging imposter syndrome for position and purpose. The world teaches us to compare ourselves to everybody else, to figure out our identity and our self-worth by looking at people around us and deciding who we are based on what we do and what we have. And that creates this sense of insecurity, this imposter syndrome, am I ever good enough? Do I have enough? What do people think about me? And in our world of working with high-powered corporates, we have people with egos with the size of planets who are always kind of jostling for position, you know, who has the bigger title, the bigger house, the bigger car. And it's easy to get sucked into that culture and that way of thinking. But anchoring ourselves or self-worth in anything other than the word of God is sinking sand. It will not hold on the day that you need it the most. Ephesians 1 tells us that we're seated with Christ. Our starting position is that we're seated in heavenly places. Ephesians 2 tells us that we are his masterpiece, made on purpose for a purpose. That's who we are. And if I could get Mufasa's voice, you know, from the Lion King, Simba, remember who you are. That's who we are. <laughs> That's our starting position. Um, and if you think about it, a masterpiece is a one of a kind. It's just unique, uniquely made. Nothing else can compare to it. And when we compare ourselves to each other, it's like Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel, looking at the Mona Lisa and going, you have funny eyes. <laughs> you just can't compare them. You are a masterpiece. That's who you are, made on purpose for purpose. So eight years ago, John and I kind of got to the 50-ish mark and looked at each other and found ourselves wondering, what do we want our lives to count for? We want to get to the pearly gates and hear God say, well done, not well. <laughs> <laughs> and we knew that relationship education had been this enduring passion, so we boldly decided, okay, this is the thing we want our lives to count for. This is what we're going to spend the rest of our lives pouring ourselves into. And for me, instantly, imposter syndrome kicked in. Who do you think you are? Look how many consultancies there are established already. Look how many things there are on marriage and coupled. Why do you think you can add anything? You don't have a degree in psychology or in 
psychotherapy or what, you know, who do you think you are? But I learned to take those insecurities in prayer to God. And I'm like, God, this is how I'm feeling about it. And instantly in my spirit, that verse from Luke 9, 13, you feed them, was the direct word to hold on to through all the journeys that would come after that. You feed them. And if we can have that, that verse up on the screen, because I want to go into that a little bit more. Um, because the way that you will feed them will be different from the food that's already available. And that's become an anchor in my soul for every time that I might feel insecure about it. So whenever I find myself <laughs> feeling outweighed by people around me, power positions, egos, material success that looks better, I just find that time with God again to have him remind me that he's given me position, he's given me purpose, and he's told me to feed them in the way that he's taught us to do relationship education. So the, the point is imposter syndrome will come. And if you struggle with um, figuring out what your purpose is, if we can have the full verse up for, from 9, verse 12 to 13, there are two clues in verse 12 and 13 that help you understand what your purpose is. The first is what moves your heart. The disciples, they noticed, they were moved by the fact that the crowd must be hungry and needing something to eat. So the first thing was they noticed it, it bothered them. So if there is something that bothers you and you wish somebody else would do something about it, it might be a clue that God's kind of prompting you about what your purpose is. And the second is that the problem was much bigger than them. They didn't even think they had a solution. The only thing they were saying is, Firstly, they thought of going to Jesus with, with it, which is also a very big clue. But their solution was send them away, let them go and find food somewhere else. And Jesus said, you feed them. And the point is, it's meant to feel bigger than us because we're not meant to do it on our own. We're meant to partner with God in doing it. And it, so if you find something that's so much bigger than you, but it's bothering you, have a chat with God about it, because maybe he's prompting you. He wants to partner with you. So the first exchange, transforming exchange, as we spend time with God, is renewing our minds from being subject to imposter syndrome to understanding our position and our purpose. Seated with God in heavenly places, dynamis power on the inside, the authority of the name of Jesus as we're in fellowship with him, a masterpiece made on purpose for a purpose. I've learned my job is to run my race, regardless of what other race, what anybody else is running. They need to run their race. They need to give their own account to God. I'm running for my own well done in my track with God and trusting that I am doing what he's called me to do. And that leads us neatly onto the second transforming experience, exchange rather. And that's exchange in striving to learning to do things in partnership with God and at his pace. You know, the world teaches us to be busy, always busy, rushing around, stressed out, striving to achieve and do more and be on the hamster wheel. And it's so easy to be caught up in this culture of busy and stress and not having time for anybody or anything, or really for the things that are really important to us. But God calls us to do life in partnership with him, with his divine appointments, with his divine insights, and at his pace. So I remember when we started the business, I literally said to God, God, if we're gonna do this, you need to be my mentor and my coach. You need to show me how to do this business. And it, I literally, I brought these in to give evidence. When I sit with God, I have these three things. This is my Bible. The older I get, the more girly I get, so I have to be color coordinated, sorry. <laughs> so this is the Bible. It's larger now because the print has to be larger for the eyes. Um, <laughs> 
And I have my prayer uh, journal because I write down the requests that I have when I spend time with God so that I can go back and record when they were answered, how they were answered. And this becomes my living testimony, my faith encourager that if God did it then, he will do it again. So this is, this is with me. And then I have another book that no, it must look nice and feel nice just because. Um, <laughs> and this is where I write insights, learnings, words that God gives straight into my, my, my heart. You know, spending time with God literally restores your soul, your perspective, your sense of centering. And I want to share with you an example of what happened. Um, if we can have that slide with the um, building mental strength, God's way. And I was, don't get distracted by the complication of it. I just want to show you what, what happened and what we did with it. Last year, I was getting really bothered by the level of stress and anxiety that was rising in our young people, including in our children and my nieces and nephews. And in my quiet time, I sat with, sat with God and I'm like, God, what is going on? What can we do about this? How can I help my kids and my nieces and nephews to understand how to build mental strength your way, how to exchange worry for prayer and all the disciplines that the Bible teaches us? And I had a very scrawly, hand-drawn picture that emerged through my quiet time with God as God inspired me with verses. And I was encouraged to have it done professionally. And uh, this is what was created. Thank you to Ashley, Linda's daughter. Linda's part of the church and Ashley. Um, and I thought that was it. But I felt that I was being nudged by the Holy Spirit that we were going to do something with it. That was last year. This year we got a call from uh, the Christian uh, Employee Network Group at one of the big global banks. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name, so I'll just skip that really big, really big global bank. <laughs> and uh, they said that the prayer requests coming into the Christian group is about stress and anxiety, so could we do a workshop on overcoming anxiety? And as we spoke about what we would share in the workshop, I kept getting this nudge from the Holy Spirit. Share the slide, share the slide. And I'm like, Lord, are you sure? Because we can't preach. We can share our story, but we can't preach in that context. And I just casually shared the slide and said, this is something that we could talk about. And they said, yes, do that. And we did. And with over 100 people around the world, pretty much every continent on the call, the feedback has been amazing, and people have been asking for copies of the slides. I said, thank you, God, and I thought that was it. Then I got another nudge, because the Holy Spirit likes to do this. Put it on LinkedIn, and I'm like, no, Lord. If I put it on LinkedIn, <laughs> some psychologist or professional psycho somebody is going, <laughs> is going to bring me or comment and hassle me about what I've missed and it's not theoretical enough and so on. And the Lord just whispered, this isn't IP, this isn't intellectual property for you to hold on to, share it. And I shared it on LinkedIn, I'm like, Lord, it's in your hands. Instantly, I get an email from, I'll tell you who she was, a clinical, she was the Oxford University lecturer, uh, clinical psychology program, like, here we go. She was asking for permission to share it at a family retreat that she was hosting. And so the point is, when we spend time with God, we get downloads, we get insights, we get food for ourselves, for our family, and to impact the lives of the people around us. That's what it's about, the divine exchanges that happen. And in partnering with God, we can escape the hurry sickness of the world. We get to learn how to do life at his pace. You know, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, a familiar verse, come unto me, all you who labor heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, take my yoke upon you. We miss the um, understanding that the Jews would have had in their culture when we talk about the yoke. Because in that, the, the way that oxen are trained to plow is that you'll have an older, more experienced, 
more mature ox, yoked with the newbie, yoked with the young ox, teaching them where to plow, how to plow, and the pace to plow at. And we miss that when Jesus says, take my yoke up on you because it is easy and it's light and I'm humble and gentle, we miss that he's saying, partner with me. Let me show you how to do life in a way that you experience peace and the right pace instead of this rush, hurried, busy, frenetic pull that the world has on us. Um, for me, spending time with God is like checking in with headquarters, global headquarters. Firstly, it's a father. God is my father who checks in on me. How are you doing? What was that conversation you had with John? Shall we talk about it? How are you doing with the kids? Yeah, or maybe you might want to change this, change that. He checks in on me to make sure I am okay. And then we, we kind of synchronize our earpieces and talk about the key things to be done. And then as I go through the day, because the earpiece is synchronized, I can hear him whisper, say this to that person. How about including this in the presentation? How about when, you, when you, we have people on the workshop, just mention this, because it's going to, you don't know who, but it's gonna minister to somebody there. And it's that synchronized earpiece. We tend to go into, God, into our quiet time with the image of this, a microphone, with no earpiece because I'm saying, God, I want this, God, I need this, help me with this. But if we can just think about the earpiece so that we can hear what God is saying in the moment and bring the kingdom of God, his presence, his power, wherever we go and do life at his pace, unforced rhythms of grace. And then the last one, protection and provision. When we exchange fear and anxiety for his protection, his provision. You know, the world tells us to be afraid and to fight every battle on our own. But Jesus says, I am with you. I fight for you. I protect you. I provide for you. And invites us to do life with that truth. Um, as my brother-in-law says, some days the, you get the bear, some days the bear gets you. <laughs> And on the days when the bear gets me, when I feel misunderstood, when things haven't gone the way I've wanted, when I make a mistake even, because we make mistakes, Psalm 91 is my literal visual, my hiding place. He who, who, who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. Sorry, I'm doing King James. I only remember the verses in King James shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I imagine myself when in that place of feeling misunderstood, getting it wrong, I am under the shadow like, God, you know my heart. Help me figure this out. Even when we make a mistake, you know, there was a time when just after COVID, we were approached by this company to um, apply for a research grant because we'd created an online program and they said we'd apply. I think if we're honest, deep down, we know that we didn't really apply, but we figured they're the professionals and money after COVID was good, so we applied. And then HMRC were on our tail, threatening a penalty. And like Hezekiah, we took the paper, I laid them before God, and I'm like, God, I am sorry we got this wrong, but forgive us and help us, rescue us. We cannot have this. We don't want to pay a penalty, which would have been more than any uh, funding that we would have gotten. It took a lot more time than it was worth, but God rescued us and we got off with just a rap on the knuckles. I'm like, thank you, Lord. He is my hiding place. He is the place that I go. You know, Matthew 6.33 says, seek his kingdom and his righteousness and then everything else, everything you worry about, everything you need, it will be added to you. God knows what we need. We could tell you stories of a box of whiskey being auctioned, a gift that we got becoming 20,000 pounds just when we needed it, of um, 
running out of money, projects lost just with the lockdown with COVID, one quick call to a charity, and without jumping through hoops, they gave us money to support us for the year. I mean, crazy stuff happens when we dare to trust God and to take everything to him in prayer, to just sit with him and allow these transforming exchanges of thinking differently, approaching life differently, doing things God's way. That's what it's about. So I want to, I want to wrap up with a challenge, as I have been challenged. We shortchange ourselves so much when we don't spend time, when we don't develop the habit of spending time with God. Do you realize, because I this hadn't really sunk in for me, that Elisha did exactly the same miracles as Jesus did? So your homework is go and read 2 Kings chapters 2 to 4. Elisha multiplied food and fed hundreds. Elisha healed the sick. Elisha raised the dead. Everywhere he went, he was relevant and just naturally supernatural, bringing life and the kingdom of God where he went. And here's the light bulb moment that went off for me. I think we have a slide on this. Jesus did miracles, not because of his divinity, but because of his humanity empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'll say that again. Jesus didn't do miracles because he was God. He did them as a human being just like us, partnered with the Holy Spirit. That's exactly how Elisha did his miracles, and that's exactly what Jesus calls us to as we experience that intimacy with him. And that's why he said, greater works we will do because the Holy Spirit has come. He's calling us to partner with him and to, carry, to experience his presence and power in our lives and to carry his presence and power everywhere we go. And so there, there are two invitations that I want to end with. The first is go deeper in your quiet time with God. Um, and don't complicate it. You know, the most honest, simple prayer that I've heard was when we had a French exchange student with us. She was French Chinese. She didn't know anything about God or Jesus or the cross. Her English was better than my French but we invited her to join us if she wanted to as we knelt to pray as a family by our bedside. We do that most evenings. And we just explained God loves you and God cares about the things you care about, what you want to pray about. And so she did this. She said, hello, God, it's me, Marie, changed her name. But just that beautiful honesty. And then she went on to pray for her grandfather who was sick. So don't complicate it. Spend time with God. And here's, here's the challenge. Make a habit. At least once a week, do more, double the time that you spend in your quiet time. And if you don't have a quiet time, start and start with Marie's prayer. Hello, God, it's me. Um, write and review your prayer request. Just start keeping track of what you're praying to God about and expect that he will answer. And then write the inspirations that you get from God. Have a journal. If you can do that at least once a week, if you're already doing that, do more. I can honestly tell you, I could spend two hours, three hours just soaking in God's presence. I will play songs, I will read, I will send a message if somebody pops in my head with a prayer that I've been praying for them. I'll chat with God about things. I might read a book that's inspiring. Just make the time to soak. That's where the transformations happen. They don't happen when we just dip. You can't get transformed. It's not even your whole body immersed. Soak. Um, and the second invitation is the divine exchange. We can't talk about transforming exchanges without talking about the divine exchange that Jesus made for us on the cross so that we can have a personal relationship with him and have a life of presence and power here and in eternity. So if you don't have a relationship with God, if you don't know who he is, if you've never spent time with him, we invite you today to get to know God, and we want to pray. So can I invite you to stand? Can I invite pastors Mark and Steph to come up, join me? You might have a word. You might want to pray. 
Um, let's just pray.